My guest today is Dr. Fergus Connolly, one of the world's foremost human performance thought leaders and influencers, and has applied performance science with leading sports, military, and business teams. He is the only coach to have full-time roles in every major sport, including soccer with Liverpool and Bolton Wanderers, professional and college football with the San Francisco 49ers and the University of Michigan, and rugby with the Welsh national team. Fergus, thanks so much for taking the time out today. Oh, thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you back on the podcast and, of course, this time diving into more of your personal insights and wisdom that you've accumulated over the years throughout your impressive career and, of course, covering your new book, The 59 Lessons Here. So I want to basically dive right in if we can. Um, Next. You cover six different themes in the book, first of which here is winning habits. And in lesson number eight, the habit is there is no difference between medical and strength and conditioning. Can you share how effectively 99% healthy is not 100% injured? Yeah, I think that, so we, we live in a fascinating age where, um, you know, never before has there been, uh, so much information available, so many research studies in physiology and medicine, pharmacology, strength and conditioning. Um, and it's led to a lot of specialization as a result of that. Um, but I, one of the, the downsides perhaps has been uh, strength and conditioning and the medical field. And as a result, you've got now in mo- many teams, many professional teams, uh, silos, sports science silos, medical strength and conditioning. And even in some organizations now, you've got rehabilitation departments um, where in reality what the solution, in in my opinion, is a holistic performance department where there is less of a gap between medical and strength and conditioning because I think it has helped create, um, by accident, uh, mind you, um, you know, failings in the return to play protocols uh, failures in communication between strength and conditioning and medical when it comes to prehabilitation or injury prevention, um, and just a holistic solution for our, our athletes. And I think that one of the downsides that you see is that when somebody gets a, a minor injury or a minor limitation, that because of the structure in some organizations, a player is deemed injured and they're removed completely from um, you know, the, the strength and conditioning or the training field and handed over to medical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that creates a lot of issues for the, for the, the continuous development of the, of the athlete. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely something, um, you know, Charlie Weingroff, our head strength and conditioning coach at Canada Basketball, would definitely agree with that idea of, of just, um, you know, the medical side, perhaps not having enough of an appreciation of what goes on you know, through rehab or strength and conditioning, and, and those are all sort of being one and the same. But unfortunately, with the siloed approach, it's, it's difficult to to really um, implement that and see that through, right? Absolutely, and it's it's partly it's a strength and conditioning error as well, in that sometimes we don't communicate or appreciate fully the restrictions and limit, limitations on the medical side in terms of the obligations that they have um legally and medically and you know i i have a a master group of of performance directors and we were just going through it last week you know it's important for strength and conditioning to be aware of the limitations on the medical side the restrictions help communicate and bridge that gap um because it's really it's a performance department as opposed to all of these different silos and you know, I've been involved in uh, facility design, and that is the first place that it has to start. Um, one of the f- things that I always insist on is that the offices are as close together as possible for physiotherapists or PTs and trainers, so that they are, you know, constantly passing each other, um, communicating, and there are fewer barriers. One other thing that is critical is that all rehabilitation should be done in the main weight room as opposed to a separate 
rehab area. You know, it, it can be adjoined as part of, but you want your athletes to understand that they will very rarely be 100% healthy anyway. You know, we mm-hmm. all of us have some small restriction, tightness, limitation. Yeah, it is incredible how um, some of those signals that we unconsciously send, if the department is in a different side of the building, uh, that rehab side and strength and conditioning is in a different section, what kind of message that's sending around that sort of continuum. So terrific point there. And, you know, if we dovetail this into part two of your book, which is technology and communication, you talk about your time with uh, Big Sam, Sam Allardis of the Bolton mm-hmm. Wanderers, uh, the manager. And in uh, Lesson 18, you say that quality of effort and action is infinitely more important than quantity or volume of actions. Can you unpack that a little bit for listeners? Yeah, sure. And this was, this was something that, um, that I was probably first exposed to by Charlie Francis, actually, who you know, I didn't quite understand. Because everybody says that quality is important. But yet, on the other hand, you hear, well, you know, everybody has to work hard and it's about sweat and everything. But the quality of interaction is critical, the quality of the experience. And it's incredibly important with team sport athletes in particular because of the tactical and technical components. In Olympic sports, quality obviously is important, but in team sports, you've got m- so many additional stimuli you know perception depth reaction sound um, that need to be absorbed so it's the quality of those uh, experiences are what improve the athlete rather than doing more and more and um, you know you know when you're talking about people's ability to observe that's one thing that Sam Allardyce has and um, and he he'll still email me He's uh, he's one of the most aware and brightest coaches I've, I've been around, um, particularly working with limited resources. Um, so, yeah, you can. There's always something to learn from every single coach that we work with. Definitely, and you know, you talk a bit about the Munster rugby team there as well, with that idea of quality of effort. Can you speak to that a mm-hmm. little bit? Yeah, and I think with with Munster in particular, the thing that they have special is is their their culture and the intensity and it it's you know i was incredibly fortunate to work with uh ronan o'gara paul o'connell donico callan and many others but those three in particular were incredibly focused and driven driven individuals and it meant that the quality of practice was always intense and the quality of every single repetition because something that I've become very aware of is that particularly in later years is that our, we, we do focus on quality, but we fail to recognize the, um, the negative impact of lesser quality or unfocused actions. So for every single rep that we make quality rep, you know, um, it doesn't take many bad ones to start to confuse that pattern or that learning. So we learn from bad actions as well. Our body does, our mind does. We learn from bad experiences. We only have to think of our own lives. You know, we remember negative events. We remember negative things. It's the same with um, te- technical ability. But sometimes we forget that. We, we don't respect how important the quality is of every single interaction. 100%. And... Yeah, that dovetails. We talk about culture there into part three of your book, which is teamwork and culture. And in that section, you share a story about the world champion boxer Bernard Dunn there in lesson, I believe it's 22, (laughs) which is listen, observe more than you talk and limit your interventions. Could you share that story? This is the one on the bus? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we, I was with the Dublin football team and we had just won, uh, won all all Ireland final and the guys were teasing Bernard because you know he he hadn't he'd been a a boxer but you know he hadn't won a football title which is every Irish kid's dream and you know the bus is teasing him and shouting he's at the front and he stood up and um, he said he just said two words he said world champion and the bus just went quiet 
you know, because <laughs> nobody has <laughs> nobody has anywhere nearby was going to be a world champion. He had been a world champion, and and he was he as a he is one of the most intelligent, insightful uh, athletes I've been around. Um, uh, and it's you know we we all coach athletes and we come across them, but the the really insightful ones stand out. The ones who are very aware and self aware. And those are the ones that you really enjoy being around because they can, you know, they can provide an insight that that we are that, that we are not uh, we don't have access to. So as players, um, you know, I've been fortunate, blessed to be around some some great athletes. So those are those athletes are the ones I've learned so much from. <clears throat> and you, you talk in the book about how, you know, whether it was yourself or someone on the team mentioning to him, you know, don't talk football tactics or things around football but if the players come to you around you know, yes life yeah. or challenges or things can you can you share that a little bit yeah so you know imagine you know as you're young and you're growing up you know you make a mistake and your parents come and you know you've made a mistake and you know what the mistake is and they start to tell you not to do it again or whatever and we all switch off because we don't want to hear it and with Bernard, when he was coming to work as a lifestyle coach and to share his experiences with the football team, um, I, you know, I, I just passed on some advice to him, which was, you know, don't speak to the players about football because that's not where your expertise is. Your expertise is in boxing, and um, and he was he listened. He didn't take it as an as you know as an affront or an insult to to take advice, but the reason was that. You know, these guys wanted to learn from another world champion, another expert, and learn from his experience in his situation, in his context, and then to allow them to draw the lessons and apply it in their own world. And, uh, you know, that's been one of the advantages of working in different sports around the world is that, you know, when I went to work for Welsh Rugby or the San Francisco 49ers, having, you know, been aware, the last thing somebody wants to hear you say is, well, when I was in rugby, I did this, or when I was in soccer, we did this. Nobody wants to hear that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but you would tell, give them experiences um, uh, that they can draw conclusions from themselves because nobody wants to be spoken down to. So you would talk about experiences that you had and things that you did and allow them to apply it in their own world. You know, you can't walk in particularly at a, at an elite level and say, well, you're not doing it right. This is the way you should be doing it. Um, you know, help people find the solutions themselves and those solutions that they come up with, with your direction will become habits. That's terrific. And I love the quote in uh, that section as well. I ain't talking fast. You're just listening slow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like you mean, uh, I think we, we've almost reached um, a tipping point in the industry where there is never before has there been so much information. And it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but we, we do struggle with the application and it's being able to refine it. And you must be aware of the person you're speaking to, how much information they have to take on board. And one of the the areas that I disagree with maybe many of my colleagues on is you don't have to explain the why all of the time. Mm-hmm. In other words, you don't have to sit down and tell somebody the real detail of the vitamins and minerals that, you know, broccoli is good. You know, you don't have, they, people say, oh, well, if they know why they'll do it, you know, you have to not all of the time. And bear in mind that they're already, as a professional athlete, they're taking on so much information, tactical, technical, psychological, all this overload, information overload. The most important thing is that they will do it. Now, you can fill in the why down the line, but can you sell broccoli to a professional athlete? Like, how are you going to do it? What what is your method of connection and communication with the athlete? Because at the end of the day, that's what matters is um, Charles Pollock went at a cut seminar many, many years ago. It was a three-day seminar, and I was there, and he, you know, Charles has so many programs and et cetera, and very entertaining. But um, always. At the, what, all, as always, yes. Um, but at the very end, you know, 
after all these programs being presented, somebody put their hand up and said, yeah, Charles, okay, we get German volume and we get this and we get it. I got one question for you. Which is the best program of all? Now, you, you know Charles and people who know Charles were just waiting for him to explode. Uh, <laughs> but, but the answer he came back with, I think it was either him or it was uh, Nelson Ayat, his assistant. It was the best answer I ever heard. It was the one the athlete will do. And so after three days of programming and et cetera, Charles's point was it doesn't matter if you write their best program if they're not going to do it. Um, so it's finding that balance between getting them to do what it is that you need them to do. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, terrific advice, especially uh, you know for myself on the nutrition front. You mentioned the broccoli test there. I mean, it's definitely finding a way to relate and bringing it back to, the, to them and making it straightforward is definitely going to go a, a lot further than giving them the breakdown of uh, polyphenols or nutrients or whatever might be the case, right? Correct. And, and one, one point that I think all of your listeners should just bear in mind as well is that you are not necessarily like your, your client or your athlete because we, by our nature, want to know all of the detail. But the person who's buying your solution it don't think necessarily like us. So they may, not, they may actually be, be turned off by all of the, the detail. They might want to know, Okay, do I just do I eat it raw or do I cook it? You told me it's good for me. I trust you. Okay, what do I need to do? Um, so just understand that not everybody is like you, like us. 100%. Um, yeah, and often sometimes that uh, extra, too much explanation takes away from the actual, as you mentioned, application and the compliance. So keep it, uh, keep it efficient is, is crucial, isn't it? Correct, correct, yeah. And that sort of uh, leads into part four of your book, which is management, facilitation, and leadership. And I, I really enjoyed lesson 29, which is you can't take your eye off the main prize, what is really important. And of course, there you talk about Charlie Francis and your work with the All Blacks mental skills coach, Gilbert Inoka. Uh, can you share a couple of insights or stories with the uh, with listeners? Yeah, well, um, Gilbert Inoka is the mental skills coach for, for the All Blacks. And when, when I was at the Niners, I remember calling him and um, he was, you know, he's been in the industry for such a long time. And I think you're always trying to, you know, keep the main thing, the main thing. There was another Marine Colonel that I worked with who would always repeat that, you know, when we would get perhaps distracted by so many different things, um, it was important to always, you know, he used to have another line, let's tackle the gator closest to the boat. So tackle the, the main nice. thing. Let's make sure that we we address the you know the, the, the most important point. And you know, I've used the line quite a bit, you know, does it affect the scoreboard? Um, so keep the main thing the main thing and uh, and, and not to get distracted because I think it's far too easy to do that with all of the information that we have available to us today. Um, in sport and and it's it's really confusing. I think I've been fortunate perhaps um, to have come in to the industry perhaps at, at a time when it was just starting to grow and I could get a handle on it now. I would be um, somewhat, uh, you know, I would feel in awe of the amount of information if I was starting out now as a as a young person. That's why you know one of the reasons I wrote the book. And with Charlie, you know, the story you're referring to is when we were sitting upstairs in his office and we're watching film. And you know, I, I went to learn about sprinting technique, and I brought him over film of all these guys running and team sport guys, and I wanted to get his feedback on correcting the sprinting technique. And we're sitting watching some slow motion film of Ben, you know, after, do, and I had all these notes taken, and I thought I really knew what I was talking about, and I said to Charlie, his left knee, you know, was swinging out a little bit, you know, did you, did you correct that, you know, and, you know, Charlie turns and looks at me and says, he's just ran 988 Fergus, you know, and <laughs> That's it's just... But it was it was wonderful because at that, that at that point, that was where I started to realize that perfection and progress are not the same thing. You're 
you know, we're looking for constant progress. We're never going to truly get perfection, but you can consistently improve the athlete. And sometimes we can make changes that achieve perfection, but don't improve the athlete. And that's one of the, just the cautions, for example, with some, with much of the testing we do, um, you know, you can have the fittest athlete, but you might not, you might not be improving them as a player. Definitely. I mean, it seems to even uh, transfer over to things like, you know, a golfer with the with the most beautiful or technical golf swing. You assume they're going to be the best player, or a, or a pitcher with the um, you know, sort of a beautiful delivery, etc. That the, sometimes this can take you away from from the actual um, output and performance, right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, as we keep uh, marching through here, part five of the book, Innovation, Resilience, and Knowledge, uh, Lesson Number 39, I really enjoyed. It reads, your ability to adapt determines your ability to succeed. Be formless. What does that mean? Well, everybody talks about, you know, um, or the, you know, the, the quote, the strongest will survive Darwin's, you know, that's a, it's a complete misquote. He, he mm-hmm. said that those who can adapt the best and, you know, when you look at great coaches, great coaches are generally those who have had the most sustained success. Um, so if you take a Belichick, you take a, a Bill Walsh, um, you know, even an Alex Ferguson, it has been their ability not simply to win, but to adapt to win um, is the greatest skill that, that's important. You know, the quote is often said, well, you um, the greatest ability is adaptability. Can you adapt to particularly over your career? And that's the difference between, that's one of the differences between good and great. Even take, you know, great athletes like Michael Jordan, you know, um, came into the league and could, yes, he was the first human who could fly. Um, you know, but then when, as, as he got a little bit, little bit older then, you know, he had to come up with a fadeaway. He, you know, he changed his game. He adapted. And even at that elite level, and that is what is most impressive about, um, you know, about these great, uh, great athletes. And it's can you adapt to, um, to the challenges that you're, you know, that, that you're faced and, and evolve the game. And when you get really, really good as a coach, you're the one who's making the changes um, that others have to adapt to. Yeah, I mean, watching Michael in his earlier career, um, early in his career, especially once the Pistons started you know, yeah. Using yeah. using the Jordan rules and really just I mean the physicality, especially when you watch the NBA now, is almost hard to imagine the difference. And he really did have to adapt to overcome that. And to to, to see him accomplish that was pretty impressive when you looked at how defense was played back in the mid to late eighties and early nineties. Absolutely, like he, you know, it was yeah. Thanks to thanks to Detroit, he, you know, went and found Tim Grover. And the first thing Tim Grover said to him was, "Look, we can train, but." The first thing that's going to happen is your shot is going to suffer. Your your skill is going to suffer because we're going to make physical changes to your body. But bear with me and keep working and keep practicing, and it'll come back. And it did. He struggled at the start, you know, with his his shooting, but he stuck with it and got stronger. And again, it's that you know hunger and desire. It it comes from a, a brutal honesty, though. It's a, it's a brutal honesty where you sit and look at yourself and go, okay. What am I good at and, and what am I bad at and, and have take the emotion out of it. Identify what your limiting factors are, which in his case at that point was a strength. Okay, I got to go fix it. You know, there's no need for uh, let's remove any arrogance and complacency. Let's go and fix my weakness or, or at least reduce its impact on my game. So it's that ability to continuously adapt back to Darwin. So from from uh, Charles Darwin to Michael Jordan. There you go, in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. Um, terrific, and I mean, that that obviously that humility and to be able to just want to continuously learn and unpack your your faults or the limitations in your performance, like 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 Jordan did, uh, leads into part six of your book, which is humility and people. And lesson forty nine, you write about the fight is won long before you take the field. And in in this lesson, you you, know, you share some stories with. I believe it was with Darren Burgess, formerly Liverpool FC performance director and now currently with Arsenal, as well as uh, Canadian Matt Nichol, formerly with the yes, Toronto Maple yeah. Leafs and obviously the creator of BioSteel, which is a big supporter for us at Canada Basketball. So, you know, Fergus, 
for yourself, why is the fight won before you take the field? Well, I think, and, and one of the guys there, Tony Strudwick as well, like, I mean, the guys like Matt Nickel, um, Tony Strudwick, you know, are... That, um, at Manchester United in particular are just uh, Richard Hawkins, Gary Walker. Like, you know, when, when I was in the UK and we would meet and interact and, and talk about what we were doing, um, like, and even Matt, you know, came over and spent time. It was just a real brutal honesty about, okay, what are we doing? What works? What doesn't work? And there was no pretense or trying to impress someone and say, okay, well, we're, you know, predicting injuries and we're doing this and we're doing that. No, no, no. Look, this is what I'm doing. This is working. I don't think this is. This looks really good, but the truth behind it is this. And when you can have that honesty among your practitioners and you're not pretending to be something you're not, that's where, as a group, you can solve problems. And, um, you know, guys like Matt, again, Matt's another guy who had an issue with very, um, you know, uh, high sugar based carbohydrate uh, drinks for or, or hydration supplements. He had a problem. He didn't like it. He, he knew that there was better out there and he went and formulated BioSteel. Um, so those are the things that make the difference, you know, long before you make it onto the field. The other point in team sport, particularly in the States and in, in, in Canada, is that in American football in, in particular, you can communicate with the quarterback or with certain players with, you know, with headsets and whatever. But um, in rugby or in soccer, there's less of an ability to communicate. That actually encourages you to do all of your coaching and, you know, to leave all of your coaching on the training field and you hand leadership over to the players. Um, and it's the, be the better coaches do that anyway. They know that they've got a limited amount of time during the week. They really install in the players, but they also give the players uh, autonomy and ownership of what they do on the field, and they develop leaders on the field. Um, and the, why that is so important is that as the game evolves, they take ownership of the situations, they can react better, and they actually become the leaders on the field. So there are fewer and fewer players looking to the sideline for direction. Like, you know, all you need to do is watch you know, Bill Belichick on the sideline and, you know, he's emotionless. He's not shouting or ranting at, at players. He's for communicating, sure. but he's just, yeah, he could be out for a stroll. Um, be, and the huge advantage of that is that the players aren't being distracted or looking to the sideline for directions. They got to solve the problems in front of them. It's definitely something absolutely that rings true, particularly in the NFL and as well as when I, talk to colleagues over here in the in the UK um, with as you mentioned you know soccer football over here and, and and rugby is that idea of the quarterback and the amount of communication that happens especially with young quarterbacks in the league of just being uh, you know told effectively really what to do from start to finish what, what's your opinion there on, on uh, obviously quarterback being such a crucial position and and that ability like Belichick and Brady to actually just build that sort of trust and build the skill level to be able to take that on uh, on your on their own, what do you think of some of the the development of the young quarterbacks and and, and the amount of information they're getting from the sideline? Well, um, I would, you know, I, I think that the more communication there is with young quarterbacks, the the more you restrict their development. Let them experience everything and let them learn from their mistakes and failings. Um, they need some direction, perhaps, or a little bit of coaching, but. You, you you can't uh, expect someone to learn. Like many of the best athletes, you know, or young college players have come from environments where there has been limited um, coaching in the sense of, you know, directional coaching and, you know, an overboard. And they learn, um, you know, their ability to, you know, react and read games and read team sports on streets, on in fields. Naturally, they you know, that's where they learn it. Then we bring them to, you know, school settings, college settings, and we start doing manufactured agility drills, you know, which make absolutely no sense. Um, why not look at, you know, how they develop these skills initially? Um, so I think it, 
a lot of it comes from an insecurity on the coaching side that we are afraid to let our players fail and learn from those those failings. We, we are afraid to allow the athlete. We want to prevent them from making mistakes. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake, as you and I spoke about earlier, unless you learn from learn from it, you know, because that will ingrain and they'll, they'll understand the learning outcome. If they don't get it, yes, you can intervene and help direct it a little bit, direct that learning outcome. But that's really what you're trying to do is you're trying to help that athlete develop, have an experience to develop uh, and to learn so that they can continue to improve. You don't always have to talk, you know, as a coach. You don't always have to talk. Very well said. And uh, being a lifetime Buffalo Bills fan, I mean, Marv Levy, a phenomenal <laughs> coach. And, uh, you know, Jim Kelly running an offense from the line of scrimmage. I mean, calling every single play. You know, yes. I mean, it's just, uh, it feels like such a, you know, lifetime ago compared to what happens now. And, of course, the few of them tend to do it a little bit. But um, it is it is amazing how things have shifted. And, um, like you I mean imagine you're driving you know you're, you're driving you're watching your gps um and you're reading the traffic and you've got your you know mother-in-law in the back seat telling you where to go what to do like you I mean <laughs> i think i've had that experience <laughs> actually it's not it's not very uh it's it's, it's disastrous it's yeah and now imagine you've got 11 other guys trying to kill you with their their vehicle at the same time so you know it's not an easy thing to do and um you know i i know a few quarterbacks who's um, you know, who's hearing when they're under pressure. Um, you know, they've told me, yeah, it's, every now and again, I just tell them that I can't hear them because <laughs> it's just easier to concentrate on my own and play what's in front of me. Yeah, just let me get on with it. Um, awesome, Fergus. Listen, last couple of questions here for you. Um, sure. The one, again, that really resonates, Lesson 51, in team sports, you need generalists to integrate and apply, but also draw on specialist experience. Obviously a powerful statement. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I and my good friend David Epstein is bringing out a book in this, which I know will be a huge seller. Um, and it's badly needed. Like I mean, just like the sports gene, you know, he was he was ahead of his time. But I'm glad I got this chapter in before he brought his out. But nice. I, the, the one of the problems, just because of the explosion and the abundance of information and studies and specialization, is that. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but it has to be drawn back to and applied in a holistic, measured way. And you see this from time to time with, uh, you know, with whether it's GPS, heart rate variability, force platforms, where one particular tool is deemed to be the only metric. Same, it's the same with um, biochemical data or biological testing. There, it's it, like you I mean anybody who do, has done any blood analysis you know, properly anyway, at least should understand the interaction uh, of of chemicals, uh, of nutrients and of depletion and understand that they're all intertwined. So having a generalist approach, being able to oversee and understand, it, and that is not to say that you can't be a specialist in an area, for sure. but to be an effective specialist, you must be able to respect the interaction of all of the things. So to be a very good strength coach and have a big impact, you also must be able to understand the interaction with, like we spoke about earlier, earlier, medical, psychology, nutrition, sports science. So that's why generalism, as a strength coach, uh, as a speed coach or as an expert, there comes a tipping point where some of us, and I've made this mistake myself, we specialize too much at the expense of being aware of the other domains that also influence that specialization. Terrific, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely a important point and, and one that's uh, a lot of nuance too, depending on the scenarios. And you do such a great job in the book of unpacking a lot of that stuff. And um, you know, I know Fergus, you must get asked this a lot. I'm sure from performance directors, business executives, corporate talks. But you know, on this whole topic, the 59 lessons obviously transfer across all domains here. Um, but if people are looking for a piece of advice to be successful. And, of course, I don't want to be a spoiler here for the end of the book, but uh, could you share one <laughs> or two that stands out for you? Um, well, I think, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, the final lesson, I guess, is, is probably one that, you know, I, I wanted to share. I wanted to write the book for, for two main reasons. One wa was that 
you know, there's a number of people, Gary Speed, um, Jerry Collins, Charlie Francis, who, you know, who have passed away. And, you know, it, it's, it's important to thank the people who have helped me or, or who I've learned from. And, I, I, you know, I wanted to thank all of those. And there, there are hundreds of people like, um, you know, Mike Prebeg, like I, you know, I, I speak about it at the end of the book who, mm-hmm. you know, I emailed and, and his, the first line of his reply was like, I mean, uh, he, he didn't know me at all. Um, and he replied and said, look, lots of so many great people have, have helped me. I'm more than happy to, to, to help you. And he, he probably doesn't even remember sending that. So I wanted to write it, you know, to, to thank those people, but also I wanted to, to share it as a stepping stone for the next generation coming through um, so that they could learn from, like it's 59 lessons, but it could almost be, you know, 40 mistakes and 19 lessons because there are so many mistakes I've, I've made, like, you know, like with Charlie Francis and different things, um, and just to understand the complexity of what we do. And then at the end, I, you know, I, I write about uh, my experience at the University of Michigan and, uh, you know, Life will throw you curveballs and you will come across people who, you know, will mistreat you and will put you in difficult situations. But you must always, you know, look after yourself as well. And that was a mistake I made. I was looking after, you know, I was looking after my girlfriend, trying to to help her through some stuff. I was looking after two different jobs at the University of Michigan. And then you, you find your job advertised online. And I just wasn't. I was looking after so many other people. And I just wasn't looking after myself and I, you know, got to a state where I didn't, you know, I thought I could handle all of the pressure, which I've always done, thought it was bulletproof, thought I could do as I've always done before. And I ended up cracking, making a mistake and uh, couldn't sleep. I drank to, to, to fall asleep and I drove the next morning and got a DUI. And um, it, it, was a, it was a very important lesson for me that we all have a limit. Some of us have, you know, big limits the amount that we can tolerate or the the amount of stress we can take on. So, you know, you you must, if there's only one lesson, it's, you know, we, when you get on a plane, they tell you in the case of emergency, face masks will drop, Um, you know, put your own face mask on before you put it on children or other people who are with you. Um, And you can't help anyone if you're not looking after your own, you know, your own rest, your, your, yourself. And, um, that's the most important lesson I think that people need to take from from the book. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, so insightful. So many lessons in the in the book, obviously, and so much wisdom as well. So I really appreciate you uh, writing that, Fergus, sharing it, and um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that connects across all domains as well. So, you know, if if, if folks want to obviously stay connected with you, keep up with your phenomenal work, or where's the best place to do so? Yeah, I'm on, on Twitter and uh, my website, fergusconley.com. And uh, yeah, no, I'm just, uh, I'm delighted with, just deli- like, I mean, I get emails and tweets and, and messages just from people who've, who've read it and, you know, are just grateful for, for the lessons and the insight. And that, uh, that is so rewarding for me. Um, I don't know. People probably don't realize how <laughs> how nice it is to get a message, to, you know, to say that um, you know they've got benefit from it and and appreciate the the honesty. Trust me, Mark. Nobody wants to be writing about a DUI that they got <laughs> or a mistake they made. But it's it you know it's just uh, it's 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 honestly it's uh, it's vulnerability, I guess. But it's you know if it can help others look out for themselves and uh, avoid making the same mistake, then it's a success. 